Hello everyone and welcome to the series of videos for week three in the course. Um, this is the course on online learning theories and models and the first video is around a rationale for online learning. We have discussed some of this in the week two videos, uh, not formally, and so this one attempts to give you some key points uh, to take away and also provide you with some resources in the form of other videos to go out and view. So as a result, this current PowerPoint is very short. I'm just going to contextualize some things for you and then send you out to some other sources. But before we get there, uh, the analysis questions for this week, looking at the appeal of online learning in its broad sense, in the sector in which you work, why is it appealing? What is it about online learning that your sector has uh, adopted as something that they see valuable? And then what are some of the common urban myths about online learning? Where did they come from? Are any of them true and how do you know? So just spend some time thinking about that and jotting some notes down before we get into this. And then we'll look quite quickly at the rationale. Now this is framed as for using ICT in teaching and learning. It comes from the Bates and Sangra reference which is in your course outline. It's a book I highly recommend. What I've provided here in the link is their website which gives excerpts from the different chapters. Uh, enough of a teaser to get you to buy the book which you do not have to for the course um, but the teaser itself gives you a bit of a sense of their writing and in this particular case some of the points that I'd like to reinforce here. So while they frame this as for using ICT in teaching and learning, many of these characteristics are completely transferable if we look at online learning broadly. There's a focus on quality, the first bullet point, a focus on flexibility, the accommodating the learning styles of the millennial, increased access, a flexibility for students around content where they can access it at any time, any place, developing the skills and competencies needed in the 21st century and there's a whole body of work around 21st century learning skills and competencies some of them we tapped into last week in the new learning videos out of the UK and improving the cost effectiveness of the system so these are some key points that they identify in the context of higher ed for using ICT for moving to online learning When we start to look at the importance of online learning, so how is it becoming so important? We spoke in our tutorials this past week about, and we will continue to, about the history of online learning that it, that it actually is in some ways quite new, but we expect it to be much older and further along than it is sometimes. Uh, but when we look back at the history, as we did in week two videos, we see that it really is, you know, 15 perhaps perhaps 20 but that would be stretching it with respect to even where the internet was at that point um, so looking at online learning I just wanted to read you a little quote from Bates's book Bates and Sangra because I think it really starts to bring home how much this is growing and that it isn't a passing fad so they say here that there is reasonably good data from the United States on the use of technology for fully online learning. Systematic large-scale studies were conducted by the Sloan Consortium, and that reference was in your last week's videos, and the Instructional Technology Council in 2008. These, this data indicates that the growth in enrollments in fully online learning in post-secondary institutions in North America has been averaging 12 to 14 percent per year over the last five years compared to only 2 to 5 percent in solely campus-based enrollments for teaching. So almost three times the number of enrollments in fully online programs offered in public institutions versus on campus. That is astounding and that's in 2008. So you can imagine where we are now in 2012. And as we look forward to for-profit institutions, so these would be um, University of Phoenix, Nova Southeastern, places like that, their market is expanding at 32% increase. So regular bricks and mortar going to campus face-to-face, -face, classroom instruction, post-secondary 2-5% to growth, fully online programs in public institutions, 12-14% to growth, fully online programs in or blended in private for-profit institutions 32 percent growth 
many of the research findings I'm just reading down here in the book to share with you. There's evidence that the trend toward more online learning will intensify over the next five years. So that takes us up to now. For instance, in the United States, 70% of students in post-secondary education will take some of their classes online. Only 20% will take all of their courses in a physical classroom in 2014 compared to 45% in 2009. So online learning is definitely important, it's definitely growing, and a large sector in, in post-secondary K-12 of people that are coming to this are people who are doing lifelong learning. Folks that have already graduated, they're in the workforce, and they're returning for more courses, more programs. What I'd like you now to do is to take some time to view these three videos and I'll just give you some context for them. The first one is done by Pearson Education. The focus is around K-12 to and it gives you a sense, uh, predominantly an American sense, but a sense of where, why we're moving to online learning in K-12, to where it's coming from and some of the benefits that they see. The second video, Daphne Kohler, What Are We Learning From Online Education, is post-secondary focus um, and she's speaking about predominantly good practice, the research coming out of online learning in the context of Stanford and some of the open online learning courses that they've done there for large groups of people worldwide and the power that it has had and some of the research and what they're learning about learning that's coming out of it. And the last one is an animate, an RSA animate done on a Ken, Sir Kenneth Robinson's talk. Um, about changing paradigms. Not specific to online learning, we'll get to one of his uh, that's more specific around technology uh, later this week, but definitely one that talks about why the paradigm is changing, why he feels it needs to change, and where technology may fit in all of that. So I will leave you to watch those and move on to some of the benefits of virtual schooling. Now this is centered in the context of K-12. The reference is at the bottom of the screen there. You're not expected to read this paper. I'm providing it as a reference for you because one of the values of this table are all the references embedded in it and you will find their detailed reference citation in the paper itself. So when you look at some of the benefits they've highlighted here, you'll see a lot of similarities with what Tony Bates and Sangra highlighted in the earlier slide that was focused on higher ed. Um, here, higher level of motivation, arguably, expanding educational access, improving quality, improving student outcomes and skills, allowing for choice or flexibility, and then that cost effectiveness or administrative efficiency. Many of these you will also see as benefits in the corporate sector and in government, and we'll talk a little bit more in detail about those as we look specifically at them in the videos coming up. Some of the challenges identified in this article with respect to virtual schooling in K-12 are the startup costs, some issues around digital divide. So access is a bit of a, a two-pronged um, benefit and potential drawback. And so the digital divide is something that has quite a bit of body of literature written on it. And in this context, part of the focus is on do you ask students to bring their own device, do you buy the devices for them, or do you work with what you have? One of the other challenges, approval or accreditation of virtual schools. In post-secondary, this is becoming a heated debate um, with the opening of massive open online courses, the MOOCs, which we'll talk about later in the course and then some student readiness issues. We've spoken about that as well around student preparedness for moving online and how it then connects to some student retention issues and so those are some of the challenges that they've identified here. Based on the brief context I've provided and the links that I've sent you out to, what I'd like you to think, think about for the synthesis questions are as follows. How does the role of the educator need to shift to facilitate the affordances of online learning? So how can we really maximize this environment and not just apply our concept of education, our traditional bricks and mortar box that education fits in, 
onto this setting? How can we really think outside of the box? And what does that look like when we do? What are the constraints that make it difficult to shift this role of the educator? And what are some strategies that help to minimize these constraints? So I'll leave those synthesis questions with you and look forward to talking with you further about them in our tutorial this week. Thanks very much.